Well, amen, church. Take your seat and good morning. This is one of our Bible drillers, Jordan Faust. Let's give God praise for Miss Jordan. Amen. Jordan has come to know Jesus Christ as her Savior and Lord. Miss Stephanie and I sat down with her, and she had a great testimony. And, and we just praise God for her wanting to follow Jesus as her personal Lord and Savior. Uh, she's had a time where she's accepted Christ and is following Him in believers. Baptism, mom and dad, and the family are here on the front row. Just love you guys. Thank you for allowing us to love on your children. Jordan, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Are you ready to go public for Him in believer's baptism? Will you follow Jesus all the days of your life to the best of your ability? Well, as the church and your church family and friends, we have no greater privilege or honor than to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are buried with Christ in baptism, and you're raised to walk in newness of life. Amen? I want to ask some of you to... Uh, make that decision today. If you have never trusted Christ as your Savior and you have yet to be baptized after you have made that decision, why not make that decision today? Amen. God loves you. He wants you to know Him in a personal way and follow Him closely so that your walk with Him will sustain you through every day that comes your way. To God be the glory. Let's give God praise for Miss Jordan one more time. Praise God for baptism. Good morning. I'm glad y'all are here today. Welcome to First Baptist Church Rodoso. We want you to feel like you're at home here. Everybody is welcome here. Um, if you are a visitor, a first time guest, would you mind raising your hand and letting us give you a card to fill out and drop in the box for us? We promise we won't send you spam. We just want you to feel welcome here. And then when church is over today, if you'll go back to the back, they have a coffee cup for you, um, just a welcome gift. But please feel welcome here. If you're a visitor and you just come visit every once in a while, please come back and see us again. We'd love to have you. Um, guys, there's some more over here I see and some more. Man, how awesome. We got all these people here that are visitors. Woohoo! So now it's our turn. Everybody's turn to get up and welcome our guests. Let me hear you say amen. amen. Turn to the person on your left and say, I'm glad you came today. Turn to the person on your right and say, I'm glad you used deodorant. Amen. We're going to receive our offering this morning. Again, welcome to you guests. We hope that you'll... Uh, feel the presence of the Lord and just feel welcome here at the house of God as we're gathered for worship. As we take our offering, we'll remind you that we're a church where everybody belongs and that we challenge all people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. We do that in three ways. We ask people to encounter God in worship, to equip together in their lives, in small groups and Bible studies, and then engage the world. Live out your faith Monday through Sunday. Amen? A couple of things also before we get going is prayer concerns and uh, brief prayer concerns and announcements. Um, a few weeks ago, many of you probably have already heard, but some of you probably haven't. Rick Warren, who wrote Purpose Driven Life, he and his wife, uh, their son Matthew, uh, committed suicide. He had uh, some mental things going on, and uh, I didn't even know all of that uh, about their son, but we want to pray for Rick and Kay Warren. They've been such a blessing to the body of Christ across the United States especially and literally the world through the Purpose Driven Life campaign. Let's just remember them as a church. Um, probably right now things start to settle in a few weeks late and then uh, we want to be there right on time praying for them. Uh, also the situations that happened in West Texas and in Boston this week. It's been a nutty week. Uh, I haven't seen that crazy a week in a long little while. Also, uh, this is the 10-year anniversary of First Baptist Church Ruidoso being in this building. Amen? Amen? Ten years ago, you guys came and entered this building, and uh, the, uh, it's a wonderful building. I love this building. It's not a perfect building. We don't worship buildings around here, but we are thankful for buildings. Amen. Uh, 
I, I can tell you it's a blessing because you paid it off. Amen. Thank you for that. Amen. For all seven of you that appreciated that, thank you. I'm just kidding. Uh, a couple of announcements, but for ministry things briefly. Um, not only that, we praise God for the church, but also the Lincoln County Prayer Breakfast is coming up. If you'd like to get tickets for that, all you have to do is get with Miss Kay in the office, and uh, she will hook us up uh, with tickets if you'd like to go. Um, also, there's an event this coming weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We're bringing in James Walker from Watchman Fellowship, and you have an uh, insert that tells you what will be happening during those days. And uh, I hope that you'll take it and look at it. We put it in the bulletin for a while, but I just want to help you. We'll email you a few times and this week and remind you. But on Friday night, we'll be gathering for worship here. Pastor Brandon will be leading us there, and James is going to talk about the occult, psychics and the occult. Rui Doso is seeing more and more psychic and occultic activity. And he'll be explaining how we can interact with that, what the Bible says. And then Saturday night, we'll come again at 6.30, and he's going to talk about Jehovah's Witnesses. If you don't know what Jehovah's Witnesses believe and or you don't know how to witness to them at all, you ought to come out and take an hour and a half of your time and listen to James. Plus, we're going to do a Q&A, which I'm looking forward to this. Sunday morning, he was a Mormon, I think, for 30 years. He'll be sharing about Mormonism next Sunday morning. And then Sunday night, I've asked him to talk about the word faith error. And then we're going to do a Q&A. And a couple of questions that I know I want to ask. I want to ask him, how do we interact with uh, Catholic theology these days. And then also, can you be a Mormon and stay a Mormon and be saved? I'm a, I've got to ask him that. And I want, to, I want to put him on the spot. And so you may have questions. We'll do a Q&A. And here's the thing. We've got to know what people believe in order to reach them for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we want to equip you, and uh, we hope you'll come back for that. Well, thank you this morning for being here. Let's bow for prayer. I want to pray over you over these matters and other spirit-led things. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to come before you and worship you. It's been a good morning already. Singing, baptism, just high-fiving people next to us and saying praise God. We worship you and bless the name of the Lord in this house. Father, we pray you'll forgive us of our sins. Nobody is perfect. And First Baptist Church is a church that's dependent totally on the grace of God. Master, this morning we lift these things to you. We lift Boston, and Boston's a place that needs Christ. We pray for churches today, that there'll be people in them in the weeks ahead that maybe are questioning where they should be with you. And we pray you'll bless those churches as they reach out in these very difficult days. We thank you for your security. We pray for the people of West Texas and ask that you will be with them as they are going to go through the next week trying to rebuild many, many things, and some things can't be rebuilt. And we pray in those decimating moments that you will be with families. We pray for the churches around West and in West that that they will be effective to minister and be Jesus in shoe leather to people who don't know Christ. Lord, we know it's a time where we need prayer. and We need to be fueled up for witnessing. So we pray for uh, James Walker, that you'll bless him wherever he's speaking here in New Mexico this morning. And as he comes for the weekend, next weekend, we pray for your anointing on him. Help us to have a love for your word and a, and a desire to have understanding with other, uh, with other groups that we have to interact with. And Master, we just say thank you for these people. We pray you minister, God, to each need in this room. Thank you, Lord, for our brother and this young man, Rio, who's going to come and play this French horn, I believe. Thank you for him. We pray for your blessing on him. We thank you for our young people. We thank you for the Bible drill. What an encouragement. Thank you for this offering. Bless the giver. Bless those who don't have anything to give that they might be givers. Bless people with jobs, resources. Give us wisdom in these very tight days of the economy to be wise with our resources. And bless everybody. Bless, Lord. We make this commitment to you. If you will get it to us, you will get it through us, Lord. We will give your resources to things that push the good news of Jesus forward 
And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. <laughs> uh, okay, my name is Rhea O'Neill, and I've been playing the French horn for almost a year now. And, you know, I like to actually play music whenever I'm not on the drum set. And I'm really glad that they let me come over here and do this because without for music, you know, without music and getting to play in church, I would have never really become a Christian. So I feel like I owe that to God to play music and try and bring people closer to God. So if my piece brings anybody closer to God, then I could say I did a pretty good job. <laughs> series in the take called the table i will invite you to open your bibles to john 21 and as we get there i want to ask you a question how many of you know what this is <laughs> ah it's not a table who said it's a table it's it's not a tv stand it's a TV tray. I can't believe you young people know what that is. This is a TV tray. How many of you remember when we were kids, we used to eat on TV trays, amen? That was like the end thing. You know, we would get our TV tray and we would uh, sit in front of the TV. It makes it easier to sit in front of the TV and just stay focused on uh, that. You know, I think sometimes we trade in table fellowship for TV tray fellowship. Table fellowship means you get to the table, you can't run from it, you see people face to face, you just are close, and uh, you're, you're, you, it, has a, it has a factor in it that a TV tray just doesn't cut it. I mean, the TV tray is all about me. The, TV, uh, the table, rather, is all about us. The, the, the TV tray can be a lonely place even packed up with all the right stuff and the remote on it and everything's good. The table is a place of community where God wants his people to be. And I'm just asking you simply this morning, 
to consider whether you're settling for TV tray fellowship when it comes to spiritual community or are you pony up to the table and do you have biblical community around a table where people know you by name your Bible's discussed maybe or maybe not as we'll see this morning in John 21 the message title is called this lessons from the breakfast table and let me show you what we mean. Stan, let's read the Word of God together for these minutes we have left. And we're going to pick it up at verse 9. We remember last week that Jesus told them, cast out on the other side, the right side, and you'll catch fish on that side. And they did. And by faith, they said, we'll go the extra mile, and they caught fish. In verse 9 is where we pick it up in the story. It says, when they got on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Father, thank you for this word. Teach us. And then move us to make some subtle shifts in our own lives so that we can be fully devoted followers of Jesus. We ask that in his name because there's power in his name and in his shed blood. Amen. As you take your seat and we think about what kind of fellowship you may or may not be settling for, you can look down at the end of this uh, chapter, at verse, uh, or rather the paragraph, verse 14. And you see where it says this was the third time that Jesus revealed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. We're continuing the post-resurrection conversations of Jesus until the Pentecost Sunday, 50 days after the resurrection. And there was a few conversations that he had to prepare his followers to take on the world. And we've examined Luke 24 already, and we've examined into John 21, and we'll be here for about two more weeks. Um, if you look at where he says it was the third time, what was the first time? The first time he revealed himself to his followers after the resurrection. His message to them was that you can have assurance in what I've done. He said, he's basically saying, yes, I died, but I have risen from the dead, and you can be assured, Jesus is saying, you don't have to worry about whether what I told you for them three years is true or not. You can have total assurance that it's true. And I've said before, in my own personal doctrine, if the Bible is not all true, I don't need any of it. But if the Bible is totally true, and it is, then I'm sold out to it. Jesus wants us to have assurance that we have salvation and that what we believe is rock solid. The second piece is doubt. You remember that when he appeared the second time, he appeared to all the disciples, but he added Peter, P not Peter, Thomas, because Thomas wasn't there on Resurrection Sunday. And Tom Thomas was the doubter, you remember. And he said, hey, here's the hands. Here's the hole in the side. You're doubting. I want you to get over those doubts. That was the second appearance. God wants us to overcome our doubts. Obviously, in these resurrection appearances. But what about this third one? What's he trying to say here? What he's saying is that here's what I've got next for you. Yes, I died. Yes, you all fled. I rose again from the dead. And now I've reappeared to you, Jesus is saying. And the first time for assurance, the second time to deal with your doubts. But now he's going to say, here's what I got next for you. Here's what this was all about. And he's going to give them the mission that he wants them to accomplish. And that is where we can tap in. Because every day that you're, believe, you're breathing as a believer, God has a great commission mission for you. He wants you to learn something. Now, we are at the breakfast table here in John 21. When they got on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish later. I love fish. How many of y'all like fish for breakfast? Let me see your hands. I know some of y'all don't, but I love fish. Fried fish. 
I'm Texan at that point, fried crappie, fried catfish. I mean, breakfast with the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice some lessons today that Jesus just gives us. And I don't think any of these are going to be uh, open the skies of heaven and fall down into fiery visions for us, but I'm hoping that some of you will say this morning, I need to move forward in my practice of biblical community, being around other believers. I'm hoping that some of you will do that. When they got there, they saw the fish and they saw the bread. What this tells us is that the, the abiding presence of Jesus Christ brings his provision into our lives. He had already been on the beach. He had already been thinking about them. He was already, the key word is already, he had prepared. He knew that, that they were going to pull up right there and he was going to challenge them to catch more fish and they were going to realize it was him. And then he already had the breakfast prepared. The fire was already burning. He didn't have to go make the fire. It was already going. He didn't have to catch his, uh, he didn't have to ask them for their fish yet. He had his own fish. He had his own bread. He had prepared. I thought about John 14 where Jesus said, I'm going to a place. You can't come now, but a place where I have prepared for you. Some versions say mansions. Some versions say rooms. It doesn't matter. If you get to heaven, you're not going to care what kind of house that you have. You're just going to say, thank you, Lord, for a house. Amen. He provides his abiding presence. He's always there for his followers. He was always there looking out for them. Now, that's a feely point, I think, for us. Isn't that true of us? I was thinking this through, and I thought, I can't remember a time when I could say God didn't take care of me. I mean, I remember coming to Southwestern Seminary, had no job, not a lot of money, and was just really struggling. I was a mid-career person, yet God, we never missed a meal. We never went hungry, and a bill may have been late, but it went paid, amen? God took care of us. He's taking care of you. He will take care of you in your older age. You're wondering, well, how am I gonna make it? Listen, if God has been faithful all these years, his abiding presence in your life, don't let your 401k stress you out. Don't let the government stress you out because they're taking all your money. Don't get stressed out. God will provide for you. His abiding presence will take care of you. Now, I know this isn't going to be exactly right, but I do want you to know that I've had a breakthrough with the IRS. I have. About, I, 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 I filed a... huh. I filed, a, I filed, I thought somebody was shocked. Um, I, I filed an extension this year. For the last four years, I've filed an extension. And uh, I'm always just a little late, okay? You don't have to amen that, mama. Uh, I'm always on the front row saying amen. He's always late. Um, um, I started thinking this year, I thought, you know, I'm going to pay my taxes. I want to pay every dime I owe. If I get some back, praise the Lord. But I don't get any back anymore. Who cares? Here's the thing. I said to myself this year, I was starting to stress out about getting it all together, and I've got it all together. I just got to add a couple things. But I, th I said, self, I had a conversation with myself. I said, self, you really need to stop stressing out. You're stressing out about these taxes. You know you're going to have to pay, and God is going to take care of you. He has every single year you stressed out. Won't you stop stressing? That's a conversation I have with myself. I'm like, self, you really need to get your act together. God will take care of your needs. The abiding presence of Jesus Christ, it brings his provision, not based on what we've done, but because of the love that he has for us. He really does care. Do you see the abiding presence of Christ in your life? Another thing. Now, I want to be careful with this. Uh, there's, there's always room for more is another principle that we need to remember in these post-resurrection conversations with Jesus. There's always room for more. Notice what Jesus says. He gives them the fish, but then he says in verse 10, bring some of the fish that you just caught. Why did he do that? He already had fish on the fire because he wanted to teach them that there's always room for more. These little subtle metaphors, and we want to be careful about pressing these things into huge, fat theological lessons. They're not all there. I'll show you a better example of that in just a moment. 
But I think when John sees these things happening on the beach and he's remembering these things, he remembers that Jesus said, bring the fish that you've caught. He wanted those followers to know, not only do I love you, but I want you to have a relationship with me. I want you to know that what you do, it partners with my kingdom plan. Now I know you may say, well, we just wouldn't have had a good day of fishing. And my contribution to the kingdom, eh, it's not all that good. I'm young, you know, what can I do? Or I'm older, my days are past. Hey, listen, Jesus says there's always room for more fish at his breakfast table. Now, Jesus, I don't think he plays around. And again, I'm not trying to squeeze it. But I don't think Jesus plays around and is accidental in what he says. Fishing was a big deal for Jesus. And he wanted his followers not just to get the fact of fishing, He wanted them to get the fact of fishing for men and women and souls. Souls that matter to God. And so when he says, hey, there's always room for more, I think that's a good lesson for us as the church. I think we should always say, hey, bring yours along. Bring it on. Jesus said, bring your own fish and put it up next to mine and let's have breakfast. That's what we want to ask you to do. We want you to see these empty seats and to say there's always room at First Baptist. We want you to see your Bible study class and don't say there's no more room. There's plenty of room if you want there to be room. There's always room. There's a living room. There's a hallway. There's a kitchen. We will fit people wherever we have to fit them so that they can get close to God and just be a part of the faith community. That's a good takeaway for us that there's always room for more. And I know it can get discouraging when you go fishing and you catch the fish and you clean them and you're trying to get them and you're trying to this and that and then you put it into the real world here and and you go man messing with people well it's messy it's messy do you realize how many times i i tweeted this this weekend that many times i don't want to get to the table i don't care if there's an empty seat i don't want to get there i just there are those moments when i say i don't want to get there anymore I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and then you get to the table and what happens? Problems, messiness. But listen, Jesus took 12 followers plus the other women that were with them and he didn't say that. Even to the one who betrayed him, he washed his feet. Man, wow. Well, okay, that changes my whole deal. My excuse has been shot at that point. I got to go to the table every once in a while and sit at the table. Not the TV tray, but the table. So there's always room. You notice, by the way, if I'm at the TV tray, I mean, how many people can fit there? If you're crazy like me, you can crowd on up. But most folks are not going to come to the TV tray and get fellowship. They need to be at the table. And here's number three. Pay attention to detail. Notice what it says in verse 11. So Simon Peter, he went aboard and he hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And he says the net was not torn. John does. Two things, 153 fish and the net was not torn. What kind of person remembers that kind of detail? You ever met that person? I mean, I'm not that person. Okay, details are not, I, I don't get like, excited about details but some people do and I'm pr- I praise the Lord for that because it compensates for my weakness but you ever know that person that you say well there was 150 fish no 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 153 fish you know that person that counts it all the way down now they probably counted 153 because they were going to sell these things they probably thought well, hey we, we're going to make some money and we you know they needed to make a living um, what's the point attention to detail my friends I don't want to say you know people have tried to make that 153 into some spiritual number let's not do that that that's that that, what does it what does it mean spiritually it does not mean some 153,000 people are going to go to heaven only or something like that okay that's not what it means okay let's not squeeze the text and make it do something that God himself doesn't do but the 153 it says to us and the net not being torn it says to us, you ought to pay attention to detail. I'm not a great detail person, as I said, but I'm going to tell you, 
I try to do it in a crowd this large, but you really can't. You can never keep up. But I actually wonder who's not here on Sunday. There's already been a couple people I've wondered. I, 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 I know where they are, and I, I wonder what they're doing. I, 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 I want to pay attention to detail. I look for people who fall out of church. I could run you down a list, First Baptist, of the people who've joined our church in the last three years. And I will tell you that a large number of people, they'll come, they'll join, they'll stay for a year, and then what will happen is they'll get challenged in their life and they're gone. And my next question is, who's watching that? Now, we can't make you go to the table. If you don't want to come to the table, don't come. I mean, if you don't choose to come to the table, you're not going to last. But once you choose it, once you choose it, you will see your spiritual growth take off. And I'm just saying we need to pay attention to detail, and I need your help. Every life group leader, every person that's a part of a, a, a class and small group, I want to say thank you for keeping up with people because there's that. Most of the time, you may feel like, man, I pay attention to detail and I'm watching the fish and I'm trying to keep them in a circle and I'm trying to keep them at the table. And I told another friend of mine years ago, a couple years ago, I said, you know, it's not about the curriculum you teach. You teach the Bible. It's about getting people to the table. That's the hard part. It's hard to get them to the table. The circles of life where spiritual growth happens. Um, I want to say thank you to those of you that do that because there's most of the time you could probably go, well, it's not all that worth it. I don't see results. But wait a minute. Think about that other person that you invited, that person you sent a handwritten note, that person you texted when God prompted you and said, why don't you text them? And you texted them and you made some light, easy table touch and said, man, just missing you. And next thing you know, on a Sunday, that person's coming to worship or that person's coming to Bible study. Or you met them over at Sacred Grounds and you bought them a coffee and you just kind of got there with them. Next thing you know, because you paid attention to detail, people came and stayed Velcroed. I, I, I tell pastors, I tell churches, and I do it as much as I possibly can It'd be easier not to do it. But I try to tell people, if you want the back door of your church to shut so that it's not a revolving door for people, you've got to Velcro them to the table. You've got to get them into little groups where they know people by name and have a sense of community where they feel loved. Now, the final thing is this. Fellowship, it paves the way for spiritual growth. Look at this. After, he, after the attention to the detail, he says, come and have breakfast. Now, I just want to draw a distinction, and we're going to delve into the uh, greater, harder conversation in two weeks. But, but here, I want you to notice something. Now, I know some of you, you, you thought, man, my pastor, he's just a glutton. He loves to eat. He talks about eating all the time. I mean, look, it says, he, Jesus says, come to breakfast. Come and have breakfast. I've prepared it for you already. Get over here. Bring some of your fish and I just want to be with you. Notice what it says in verse 12. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it. Notice the Lord's Supper symbology there. Uh, he gives them the, the bread. He gives them the fish. And it says this was the third time that Jesus was revealed to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Fellowship paves the way for spiritual growth, my friend. It means this. You know, notice Jesus, before he had the hard conversation with Peter, notice he says to his followers, I just want to eat with you guys. I think it shows how much we love each other by who we eat with and, and how often we eat together. You know, I have to admit, I'm going to just throw my heart out on the table. If you were to ask me, Pastor, in your home, do you guys have fellowship that's based on the table or the TV tray? I'd have to pick the TV tray because we're so busy. We're busy with technology. We're busy with everything. We're busy with life. And so it's easier just to kind of get it. I mean, there's three kinds of breakfast. One is uh, uh, the fly out the door breakfast. You ever, you've seen that one. That's when you're going out the door, give me the granola bar and uh, I'll see y'all later. Uh, you know, another one would be to sit down at the table and prepare uh, that breakfast. Which one are you? Which breakfast do you follow? Uh, 
Oh, it's the drive through breakfast that I forgot. drive through You know, you go through, give me a number one. That's how we want our fellowship. I'll take a number one with the coffee. And, uh, you know, if it's wrong, we go off on the person over at McDonald's, man. Don't ever do that and call yourself a Christian. That was free. Um, some facts about breakfast. Morning is when we usually eat breakfast. But sometimes breakfast is good at night, amen? I love pancakes at night. It's a simple meal, yet it's the most important meal of the day. Your mama told you that, and you should have listened to her. Requires preparation, I've said that, and time to be fully enjoyed. Now, you can either have a, now, I don't mean this the wrong way, but, okay. You can either have like a little frou-frou breakfast, or you can have a man breakfast, baby. Man, biscuits, gravy, eggs, bacon. You can get turkey bacon, fry it good. I mean, I, I, the metaphor there would be, in the morning, Lord, you will hear my voice. I will prepare a sacrifice with you and for you in your word, and, and I will watch, Psalm 5.3 says. In the morning, Lord, I want to be close to you. I want to have breakfast with you. Listen, here's, here's, here's a great takeaway. For some of you, you're like me, you're so busy in a season of the year that your mornings and your breakfast with the Lord, it has, it's non-existent. It's nothing compared. It's, you're driving through when you ought to be sitting down. And I want to ask you today to, in the mornings, rekindle your breakfast with the Lord, a spiritual breakfast in the Word. Give yourself time to sit there and get your bearings. And this is a constant fight. But I just want to say this too. And I want to restate it. And listen, we don't eat together just because we have an agenda. We eat together because we like people. And I think sometimes we have an agenda. And it's not always bad. I'm just saying Jesus, before he said anything else to them, he said, come here, I want to eat with you guys just because I love you. I like you. I care enough to sit down and eat with you. Let's take that away from this house today, that we can sit down with one another and eat together and just exist. We don't have to get... Sp the spiritual... The fellowship paves the way for the spiritual. Sometimes the fellowship, I, you know, I'm terrible. I'll get to the breakfast table. I'll get to the table, start a conversation. And I want to start talking the Bible. I want to ask you where you are with the Lord and all this stuff. And uh, I had some friends in the car yesterday, went to San Alamos, uh, Los Alamos, and back over the weekend. And, 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 and they probably thought, man, this guy's asking a lot of questions. Uh, it was John Marshall over at Calvary Church, so who cares? He needs it. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying we don't always have to get overly, aggressively spiritual when we need to be hanging out. Because when we hang out enough, we won't hurt one another. When we hang out enough, we just kind of hear each other out and hear our hearts. Well, all of a sudden then, God begins to build this spiritual atmosphere where real things can happen. And I'll tell you, I desire the real thing. I don't want TV Tray Fellowship. Not if it comes at the expense of the spiritual smorgasbord buffet that God has for me. I would rather know God and his people in community than to do it alone. And you are not meant to do it alone. You can sit there and say whatever you want, but I'm telling you the Bible is replete in so many examples of where we need one another. And it's not always easy. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying I won't say something that will be wrong. Or I'm not saying that you won't. I'm not saying that. But when you do, you know what? I sit there and go, you know what? We're at the table. And because we're at the table, I'm going to be understanding before I judge. Or I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt because our proximity is so close. I can't be rude. I, I can't do that. Which one are you? TV tray or table? Father, we thank you for the privilege to gather in your name. As we stand and sing in a moment, for those who've never trusted Christ, we pray you give them boldness and courage. For those who need to follow Jesus and believers' baptism, we pray you'll give them courage. 
We pray that those of us that need to make a shift from TV tray to table, God, I know I need to. Help me, Lord, to just unpack that in my heart this week. Whether it's at a real table in our homes or it's a small table over at a restaurant or a little place, just wherever, God, whatever it is, help us to see that it's you. Lord, this morning, for those who've never trusted Christ, would you give them the moment that they need a realization, conviction of sin, faith in Jesus, faith in the gospel. Others need to talk to you for a moment about something maybe unrelated to anything we've done here, but it was brought in and maybe just need to, you need to lay something down on the altar before God, my friend. Why don't you do that in your prayer closet right there where you're seated? Just take a moment and say, God, this is, this is bothering me. This is burden me. Lord, I'm a TV tray Christian and I want to get to the table where there's more food. Whatever that is for you, why don't you just listen to Pastor Brandon for a moment as our heads are bowed and we're just meditating. And let God do some surgery with you today.